Hi, everybody. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, this is Asut Ashutosh from the IFC team. Uh, we just I want to again welcome you for the day two for the TCFD session for the financial sector. Uh, thank you for all the colleagues who had joined yesterday. And uh, we, of course, look forward uh, to, it, to everybody being there for the entire session today. Uh, you know, as 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 uh, we mentioned, this uh, training session on TCFD is something which by IFC is partnered uh, with UNSSE, with UNEPFI, and CDP uh, globally. Uh, for the India session, we have partnered with IBA and we have partnered with IIBF to roll it out to the different colleagues in India. Uh, I would I want to hand it over to Mr. Chandrasekhar, Senior Advisor, IBA, uh, for some opening remarks. Uh, Mr. Chandrasekhar. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, Astosh, and uh, a warm uh, good afternoon to all the participants. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you uh, to this uh, second day session of the uh, training program on TCFD. Um, <clears throat> just to give a sense of where I, I know IBA comes in, uh, IBA has been mandated by Reserve Bank of India to create capacity for the uh, banking sector, actually, in respect of ESG uh, issues, uh, while the uh, discussion paper that has been published by the RBI last year. So uh, just you know, uh, IBA doesn't have an in-house expertise actually in this area. So we, you know, uh, we call upon the experience of our partners actually like IFC and other practitioners actually who are into uh, the practice of ESG, and they have been kind enough to you know accept our you know request actually, and then uh, they have you know structured uh, training programs so suiting our you know uh, the needs of our member banks actually. That is the uh, you know origin of this uh, sort of collaboration actually, and the uh, subsequent training programs that have been held by IBA. Uh, the uh, IBA has also entered an MOU with IFC actually for a for a collaboration in respect of training in, in respect of you now uh, uh, forming a course you know, basic course actually for to enable the financial sector professionals to you know to, to acclimatize themselves and to get some basic expertise in terms of environment. They have already published uh, you know the uh, or they have already started the first level course actually for the uh, professionals financial professionals. And uh, the uh, framing of uh, the course content for the higher level program is already in an advanced stage. And we look forward to you know, uh, announcing this uh, program actually shortly. Uh, IBA, uh, IBA, Indian Institute of Banking and Finance, and IFC are collaborating this regard in setting the agenda. So, uh, as a part of our mandate, actually, we are you know, uh, committed to have more such programs going forward. And uh, I'm really happy to note that this uh, program has attended more than almost 500 you know, participants yesterday. And uh, the response uh, to all the you know uh, uh, polling that has happened actually during the course of this season was very robust actually, indicating that uh, there is a fair amount of uh, you know uh, uh, knowledge that is uh, residing with the uh, banking system. If you already they are able to uh, you know uh, respond positively to many of the questions that have been raised. Actually, which is really heartening to us actually because the way we started from actually we we started from almost the ground zero level, and today uh, you know for people to come and respond to this high level uh, course. Uh, in an enthusiastic uh, manner, uh, indicates that uh, people have been investing uh, a lot into their you know, training and you know, acquiring the capabilities. So we are very happy about this. Actually. And uh, we promise our member banks that we have more such you know, programs that will increase their knowledge going forward. So with these few words, actually, I uh, request you know, Sasatosh to take, uh, you know, go ahead with the uh, so I wish you, uh, you know, happy learning. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Mr. Chandrasekhar. Uh, passing it on uh, to our colleague from UNSSC, uh, uh, Tiffany. Great. Thank you, everyone. And thank you for those wonderful opening remarks. I'd like to e welcome everyone back today uh, for our second day of this TCFD Task Force on Climate-Related Financial Disclosures training. Uh, we had a very interactive training yesterday, and we look forward to today's session. Um, before we start, a big thank you to our hosts, um, thank you to IFC and the team that we've been working with, Ashutosh and Anjali. Thank you for your collaboration. We also thank, of course, the IBA and the Indian Institute of Banking and Finance and the other local partners that have helped to bring this to you in India. Um, as with yesterday, we have a number of partners helping out today. Uh, myself and Vanina from the SSE, and we're joined again from uh, CDP with Huma. Um, and um, we have Jan, who is here in the background, answering all your questions from UNEPFI today um, to do some presenting. And we also have Wenmin, who was presenting yesterday, here to answer your questions as well. Um, as with last time, um, please do remember that this is meant to be an interactive session. So many of you have already introduced yourself in the chat box. Please feel free um, to use that space to interact and to introduce yourself. 
Um, also, um, please make use of the Q&A box to ask all of your questions. Um, if you do ask that question in the chat box, you'll be asked to instead ask it in the Q&A. This way we can keep track of all of your questions and make sure that we can answer as many of them as possible. So today's agenda um, is um, similar to yesterday. So we have two more pillars to cover. Yesterday, we looked at governance and strategy. Today, we're going to look at risk management and metrics and targets. And holistically, that makes up the four core pillars of the TCFD recommendations. So we'll start today um, with the first of those, that's uh, uh, risk management. So we'll look at climate-related risks and opportunities for banks and then how to manage those risks. Um, and then we'll take a moment to look at the final pillar, metrics and targets. And for both of those, we'll look at what does the TCFD recommend and some examples of what that looks like in practice. We'll again take about another, a five minute break around the halfway point. And then in the second half today, we're going to deep dive into um, a few key aspects of metrics and targets. Um, one key aspect is, of course, net zero targets and how to set those. What does that mean? Um, and then how do we achieve these net zero targets? Well, that's making use of a transition plan. So we'll discuss um, what that means and we'll do an exercise together on that. Um, we again have four key objectives today. Um, so first, we like to help you to be able to identify practices to manage climate-related financial risks and opportunities that are facing the banking sector. We're also here to help you understand what measurements and appropriate and effective or are appropriate and effective in measuring and setting targets for climate resilience. Uh, also, we're here to help you to understand how a transition plan and setting net zero targets can be implemented in your organization. And finally, to help you to identify how the TCFD recommendations can be used um, with other key tools and frameworks in order to create resilient and agile strategies. Great. So with that, um, let's do a quick recap of what we learned yesterday. Um, so as a reminder, these are the four core pillars of the TCFD's recommended disclosures. So remember, we have 11 core recommendations. So we have two governance recommendations and then three strategy, three risk management, and three metric and targets uh, recommended disclosures. It's also important to remember that while these core four pillars are often presented separately, they are very much interconnected. As a reminder from what we discussed uh, yesterday in the first part of our training, while um, the caveat of um, trying to discuss these each separately, we of course wanna see them all together. And the objective is to understand how it has a financial impact. Um, there are certain disclosures that the TCFD considers um, will have a financial impact to all organizations. So that's the governance pillar, as well as the risk management pillar. Um, note that with the, uh, the second disclosure of metrics and targets, which we discussed today, um, which will be GHG emissions, is also considered financially material to all organizations. So that means those disclosures, all companies should start um, disclosing them as soon as possible. Um, the strategy and uh, the rest of the metrics and targets pillars have um, a materiality lens applied to them. Um, so what we want to understand is what has a financial impact, and we only need to disclose that. So um, for an example, um, if you're thinking of disclosing um, how many trees you're planting um, towards uh, either a net zero target, um, or um, your emissions accounting. If this is a philanthropic project for your organization um, that you contribute to, um, or maybe it's something to um, motivate your staff, you should um, consider um, whether or not this actually has a financial impact on your organization. And if not, you can disclose that in your um, sustainability report. Um, but if it does have a financial impact to your organization, um, then you should um, include that in your financial reporting. So as a quick summary here, governance and risk management are more the processes behind the scene, how you make sure that you're prepared and that you're resilient. 
and the absence or presence of these processes will have a financial impact on any organization as it determines how resilient and prepared an organization is for climate-related risks and opportunities. And then the strategy and metrics and targets are really how you're acting strategically and measuring this moving forward so that uh, report readers can understand the actions you're taking uh, to measure, mitigate, and or adapt. So with that, let's do um, a quick poll. Um, so we only have um, two polls today, so we appreciate your participation in them. This one asks, what elements of a climate scenario are relevant when exploring transition risks? So yesterday we discussed um, both physical risks and transition risks. And as a reminder to everyone, transition risks are those risks related with a transition to a low carbon economy. So we discussed um, various different transition risks um, and some of them have different metrics that we'll want to include when we're doing a scenario analysis. So I'll give you a moment to fill that in. Great, everyone's doing fantastically. So I think the majority of you have spotted the physical risk in this list. So um, number one, two, and uh, four. So carbon prices, sectoral emissions, and economic indicators are all useful when we're exploring a scenario for transition risks. Um, however, sea level rises are more of a uh, physical risk. Um, so sometimes, as we saw yesterday with NGFS, we can combine these two risks, physical and transition risks, for our analysis. Um, but sea level rises in particular are a physical risk. Great, I'll stop sharing that and let's continue. So another reminder from yesterday is uh, where this information should be disclosed. Um, so first and foremost, um, one thing we were trying to emphasize yesterday is that the task force um, on T for TCFD really is recommending this disclosure to be part of your annual financial filing package. It's not meant to create a new report or a separate TCFD report. Sometimes companies do create a secondary report like a TCFD report. We only recommend doing that if you've identified climate change to be particularly relevant to your stakeholders and you really wanna pull all that information into one place. It should, however, in addition, appear together with your annual uh, reporting package to investors. So how you disclose that information is not prescribed by the TCFD. This depends on the type of information being disclosed that you've identified to have a material impact on your organization, and it should align with your national disclosure requirements. So what should be disclosed? That's really what the TCFD is there to help you with. Um, so as mentioned already, um, the what is the financially material information. So what has that financial impact on your organization? And the TCFD really helps you to identify climate-related financial information. So as I just mentioned, anything in the governance and risk management pillars are deemed to be material for all organizations. So all organizations should be disclosing at least those five recommended disclosures. Um, and then when we look at strategy and metrics and targets, um, you should apply a materiality lens and assess um, what has a financial impact and disclose that information. Great, so moving on to those financial impacts then. This image is really straight out of the TCFD where they summarize how these risks and opportunities hit the company's financial statements and relate to financial reporting. When doing that materiality assessment, this can help to understand that those risks and those opportunities both flow into our strategic planning and risk management, which then flows into our financial impacts. And then that's where we see it hit our income statement, the cash flow statement, the balance sheet, et cetera. So understanding how these risks and opportunities really flow down into the financial performance of a company um, is essential here. 
Um, but also making sure that what we're understanding that it's not just, of course, the financial performance, but also um, the format, the portfolio of an organization. So we also want, want to understand how this impacts um, our portfolio, our capital, our financing, our assets, and our liabilities. Another tool that we discussed last session um, when discussing how to get started is using a TCFD table like this one, um, which is two important utilities. In the first uh, instance, it helps you to identify any gaps in your own reporting. Um, as you'll see, this table here is simply the 11 recommended disclosures on the left, and then it identifies where in, in the organization's report you can find this information. So of course, if you can't find this information, you can't fill out that section of this table and it helps you identify what information is missing. You can also use the SSE model guidance. In Annex 1, we have a more thorough checklist that you can use to do that gap analysis. It also has a secondary function, and that is, as we discussed, uh, TCFD doesn't tell you where this information should appear or how you report this information. It talks about what information you should disclose. So all organizations are disclosing climate-related financial data in different sections of their report in different ways. So a mapping table like this helps investors be able to easily find that information that they're looking for. Great, so um, before we finish up this um, overview of our learnings from yesterday, let's just um, discuss five quick tips on implementing the TCFD. The first tip is, um, as you get started, figure out where you are now. We discussed last time at the beginning of your roadmap, you should really do a gap analysis using, um, for example, the SSE's um, TCFD checklist in Annex 1 of the Model Guidance on Climate. In this point, you really should be identifying current climate risks and opportunities and identifying whether those are reflected in your current reporting practices. Another tip is to make sure that you're getting internal buy-in. We talked yesterday about really getting that tone from the top and the importance of governance. So here you might want to really focus on identifying the financial impact of climate risk so that your board, uh, that your directors understand um, why this information is so important to the strategy of the organization. You also might wanna consider upskilling the board and the management and the leadership to ensure that they understand fully these risks and opportunities and that financial impact. And to do that, you may wanna consider bringing in external expertise and of course, we also recommend establishing accountability and incentive structures here. The third tip is to collaborate. Um, we talked yesterday about having a TCFD team and that this is really a whole of organization exercise because climate does impact all of the organization, not just one select team. Um, so making sure that you're having collaboration throughout your organization is key. Um, and in that TCFD team, we often uh, suggest having a um, leader from the top, maybe from your board or executive leadership to really link back to that second tip um, and having that internal buy-in by setting the tone from the top. Um, it also connects to tip four, learning from others. Uh, you don't only have to collaborate internally within your organization, but you can uh, collaborate externally as well. And you can learn from what other organizations are doing and other banks may be in your area as well. Um, we suggest making use of the TCFD Knowledge Hub in order to see what your peers are doing. You can see there other reports um, that are aligned with the TCFD's recommended disclosures that can help you get started. And the final point is exactly that, get started. Don't let um, perfection be the enemy of the good. Um, this is a constantly evolving space. So there's no need to wait till you have it all figured out. As we saw in our roadmap yesterday and that um, stepped process from TPI is you often just need to get started to build that capacity. Then you can start to build this into your um, operational decision-making and then move into building it into your strategic decision-making processes. Great. So with that, let's do one more um, 
a little short quiz today. Uh, just give me one moment to launch this. Great, so you should have that on your screen now. And the question is, disclosure of material climate related financial data should appear where? So we just discussed this, that we're just um, checking to see if it's clear, but the key word there is of course, material information. So this is information that has a financial impact to your organization. And I'll give you just a moment to fill that in. Great, I'm glad to see that that message was very much clear. So um, with now more than 60% of you having filled that in, I'll share the results. And fantastic, you all got this correct. Um, so the annual financial reporting package for investors is where we want to put material information. That said, you can then supplement that and add it to your sustainability report as well. And you may want to also have it on your website. Of course, if this is really filtering into your strategic decision making, it should also be in your internal documents. But those last three answers, the sustainability report on your website and in internal documents, those answers are only in addition to, that should not be the only place that you're finding this information. Great. So with that, now let's take a minute to discuss what are the climate-related risks and opportunities um, that banks should have an eye open for. So while keeping opportunities in mind, let's first discuss risks. We currently see an overview from the Network for Greening the Financial System, which really illustrates risks that could affect the economy and financial systems through a range of transmission channels. This overview also helps to understand impacts. So if you now look on the uh, side, the left side of the slide in, um, uh, sorry, the right side, of, no, left side of the side on, on the green one, let's look at that. Um, you can see um, here we have a dichotomy of climate risks split into uh, transition risks and physical risks, which is what we were discussing last time. And then if we look in the middle, um, in that gray box, uh, you can see the different transmission centers, which takes both a micro and a macro view. And on the right-hand side, then, um, with that more turquoise color, um, you can see then what are the financial impacts. So, for example, transition risk, if you focus on that first um, one, we can see how consumer preferences are altering, which in a micro perspective affects businesses through changes in demand for certain products, which is amplified then by household changes, um, such as changes in costs, and at the same time can influence employee satisfaction, impacting um, uh, production costs as well, which then creates a financial risk for lenders and investors at the same time. So as you see, it's much more complex than simply this risk creates this impact, but this helps you understand that holistic picture. So let's look then at physical risks. We can see an increase in acute risks, such as extreme weather events, which can then impact productivity at the macro level, but will also increase costs at the micro level uh, for both households and for businesses. And for the financial side, underwriting risk increases as insuring assets may become more difficult or more costly as physical risks can possibly lead to lower insurance coverage in some regions. And also, if you look at the bottom of this slide, we see a little gray line, and this is actually meant as a feedback cycle. So this can really mean that financial impacts can have economic impact. But at the same time, that economic impacts at, uh, co impacts a country's transition. So there is a real interlinkage between these different categories here. So a top question we're really being asked is still, what are the risks? And how do you measure those risks? 
Uh, where should you focus your attention and how do you actually prioritize the right industry sectors or portfolios? And this is why um, we bring this slide here. This is the result of one of UNEPFI's TCFD banking programs um, projects from a few years ago, which was designed by the members at the time to really help financial institutions to expand uh, your toolkit for climate risk assessment and also to use for disclosure. I think um, everyone knows every sector really brings different challenges or obstacles with the green transition. And because portfolios are often quite diverse, Unipify's banking program made a decision to come up with these eight sectors in order to summarize the risk profiles. Here you can see the ratings and the heat map for each of those eight sectors, oil and gas, agriculture, real estate, power generation, metals and mining, industrials, transportation, and services and technology. And the mapping therefore reflects a level of risk that the participants believed at the time are likely to occur from an ambitious or just transition under the scenario of limiting the warming to well below two degrees, which is in line with the Paris Agreement. So a heat map is generally a really great tool for evaluating, disclosing, and managing your risks. And if you have any questions about Unipify's tools, please take advantage of our Unipify team members who are here today. So another interesting report you should become familiar with is this one by Carbon Tracker. As you may already know, it's been shown that in order to limit global warming um, to 1.5 degrees um, uh, of pre-industrial temperature, 90% of fossil fuel reserves must really remain in the ground. Um, and that is what we refer to as stranded assets. So assets that we can't take out of the ground if we're going to meet this target. Unburnable carbon, this report um, uh, that looks 10 years on, finds that the majority of embedded emissions are actually listed on stock exchanges of China, USA, India, Russia, and Saudi Arabia, where with the exception of the US, emissions are dominated by partial listings of state-owned companies. The report quantifies the stranded asset risk exposure for the oil and gas assets and finds over 1 trillion US dollars of oil and gas assets risks um, being a risk at risk of being uh, stranded. And the majority, about 600 billion of that, is held by listed companies on stock exchanges. Um, in absolute terms, this stranded asset risk is concentrated in financial centers of New York, Moscow, London, and Toronto. And with that, I'll go into the last slide of this section, and we will end on the same note we started, the importance of opportunities. So to exemplify what we mean by opportunities, let's look at a real life example here. This is an overview that was published by the Canadian city of Calgary in their climate resilience strategy document in 2018. We have on the left side of the circle mitigation strategies, which is really the city's strategies to reduce emissions. And on the right hand side, we have the option to manage the risk of climate impacts. And what I want to highlight here is really the interplay or the overlap between mitigation and adaptation, which should really be considered together because that's where we find the resilience. If we look into the overlapping, this is where we can see uh, the company is starting to build up their climate resilience, which means that in the future, if we successfully take those actions on both sides, we might come up with real solutions for water conservation, new energy systems, or education and local food production, for example. And again, this was really where the different opportunities arise. The TCFD also further provides a few main categories of opportunities to help identify them, which are, as a reminder, resource efficiency, energy sources, products and services, as well as markets and resilience. So there are a lot of opportunities that arise, such as coming up with more efficient ways of transport. We can have... Um, also more efficient product projections. We can adjust the distribution processes um, due to, and we can change technology. We can have different recycling systems as well as more efficient buildings. And uh, these 
opportunities, if they are taken, they can also lead to different positive financial impacts for an organization. We expect to see the companies capitalizing on these opportunities will have reduced operating costs or production capacity can be increased because the systems are more lean and more efficient, for example, and we can have improved health and safety for everyone involved as well. So with that quick overview of the risks and opportunities that should be considered and evaluate, evaluated, I will remind everyone to review the risks and opportunities categories proposed by the TCFD to help get started and to use the TCFD's supplemental guidance document to help with identifying the financial impact that might result um, from these risks and opportunities. And with that, uh, once we identify those risks, how do we go about managing them? So let's go move into the third pillar of the TCFD. So reflecting back on the four core pillars of the TCFD's recommended disclosures, the risk management pillar is really about just closing in on how the organization identifies and manages climate risk. So as we mentioned in part one, it is one of the more qualitative disclosures that we see. And to remind everyone, like the governance pillar, the TCFD considers the three risk management disclosures to be financially material to all organizations, as it sets the framework and processes needed to ensure all relevant um, or financially material risks and opportunities are identified and then appropriately managed. Broadly speaking, what this pillar asks opportunities or asks companies um, to do is to process um, uh, how they're going to identify, uh, assess, and manage climate-related risks. So what we can see is that risk, the risk management pillar um, contains three broad recommended disclosures. And as you can see on this slide, we have A, B, and C general disclosures, as well as supplemental or additional disclosures recommended in category A, specifically for banks. So let's look first at category A. The recommended disclosure is about describing the processes for risk management that allows for identifying and assessing climate risk. So all organizations should be considering disclosing how risks are identified and explaining the methodology used. And for example, if you are not using the risk categories provided by the TCFD, explaining why not and how you compare different risks. In doing so, it should also be understood by the report readers how regulation is considered when evaluating risks, and banks should, in addition, in addition to these recommended disclosures, um, provide information on how risk categories are integrated into traditional risk categories used by banks. So, for example, we want to understand um, the climate risk impacts on credit risk, on the market risk, on liquidity risk, and on operational risk. Now let's go down the checklist and look at category B, risk management processes. So here we're focusing on how the organization is managing and prioritizing those risks. So the previous one was identifying. Now what are we doing with those risks? And this is the information on how decisions are going to be made. And as we heard in part one in the governance section, we're, we're asked to provide insight on who is actually doing what and who's responsible for assuring risks are effectively managed. And then here we're discussing in the risk management component, what is, what is being done? How are those risks being mitigated or accepted or um, control functions being set up to manage them? And this is really where we talk about the processes on prioritization um, and um, determining um, whether we're deciding to mitigate, transfer, accept, or set controls. And then finally, we see um, numbers or letter C, which is about integration. Um, so here we're really focusing on 
the integration of climate-related risk management into your overall risk management processes. And this is really to get an understanding of how the management views climate risk and how climate risk is integrated into different risk frameworks, which are mostly already existing in your business. So there are two important aspects to consider here. The first being that climate is a non-diversifiable risk. And also it's widespread. So it should be really considered alongside and integrated in all existing risk considerations. We often get asked at this point, well, what's the difference then? If climate is part of all of our risks, shouldn't it just be a part of our risk management processes and just integrated holistically? What's important to also note, however, though, is that at the same time as being non-diversifiable, climate risk also has different time horizons and less certain impacts than other risks that banks are used to dealing with. Um, so we need to understand how those uh, differences with climate risks are being um, evaluated within your organization. So um, before we go into a few examples, let's look at how we're doing so far as the banking sector. As you see here um, from the TCFD's 2022 status report, and as we heard in part one, um, the status report comes from a review of hundreds of public reports using um, AI to help understand to what extent companies are aligning their disclosures with the recommendations. And we can see um, here now just the overview of the strategy pillars three recommended disclosures, but I highly recommend you use the link here and go to the report as well, because you can uh, also see some other charts immediately related to disclosures and see a bunch of examples. But looking at this from a high level, we see strong growth in all three recommended disclosures um, with dis disclosure in category C, the integration into overall risk management increasing the most since the 2019 status report. Um, this is significant as it's actually the greatest increase in disclosures from 2019 to 2021 of all 11 recommended disclosures, which range from about a 5% increase. Um, to at the lowest end to a 20% increase in this category. So I'm going to, in the interest of time, skip by this slide, but I do recommend you take a look at it if you're unfamiliar with how climate risk fits within the holistic ESG um, profile. Um, but let's look at an example. So this um, first example is a disclosure from HDFC, which is an Indian bank and is taken from their sustainability report. And what I think um, has been done very nicely here is really to lay out the anticipated risks exactly as categorized by the TCFD. And while this is just a snapshot on the transition risk side, if you open the report, which is linked to in the handout, you'll see that they did the exact same thing for physical risks as well. What I do want to highlight um, here is they are not only describing what the risks are that they identified, but more importantly, in line with the recommendations of the TCFD, they are describing how the company identifies those and how they are actually managing them, which is really what we want to understand. So for example, we know from this clip here, um, the screenshot that the operational risk management department designs tools and techniques for identification and monitoring of operational risks. And we can see that in the table of anticipated risks associated with climate change, where they identify the risks um, as well as how they manage that risk, um, we get more information of how that's done. We can read in the first risk, for example, um, that all large projects are required to comply with environmental laws, which is a policy that they've set to ensure um, uh, mitigation. Uh, what I also think is interesting um, to see in the snapshot here is that we can see the interconnectedness of the different pillars. So we are getting the information on which committees are set up, um, which is pertaining to the governance disclosure recommendation, but they're also telling us how it is working and giving us more information about the risk itself. Um, so as we mentioned, um, while we present these pillars separately, when you put it in your disclosure, they can all ki kind of come together and they should be disclosed in a way that makes most sense for your organization. 
So the second example is from ABN AMRO, which is a Dutch bank, um, which has integrated aspects into their annual report through an integrated reporting framework, uh, which you re might remember um, as being a key objective to the TCFD of integrating this information. Um, so this example illustrates how their sustainability risk policy framework is integrated into their enterprise risk management framework using a risk taxonomy. So um, if you remember in category C of risk management, we really wanted to understand that integration. Um, so what's particularly good here is that it defines conditions under which the bank's business generally works. What I want to highlight is that while sustainability risk is considered a financial risk, um, some aspects of the TCFD's risk categories go beyond financial risks and into operational or non-financial risks, such as legal risks and behavioral risks. So TCFD would be addressed beyond that sustainability risk component there. ABN AMRO also indicated that in 2022, uh, they assessed the materiality of climate-related and environmental risks in uh, relation to their traditional risk types. And the initial assessment was qualitative, uh, for some risk types, they then went further and substantiated with quantitative information, uh, whereby a distinction between materiality in the short term, which for them was one year, medium term, which is five years for them, and long term, which is 30 years for them, was made quantitatively where possible. And um, we have one more example here. Um, so um, this next example is from a Brazilian bank. Um, we are looking here at the annual report of Banco do Brasil, and they are showing a materiality matrix. Um, I don't have a bunch of time to go through this example today, but what I do really want to highlight is that they, um, in this report, really clearly identify um, how they made this matrix, which I think is really important um, for report readers to understand. We often see matrix, matrices like these end up in a report, but we don't understand really how those dots got on the report. So this is a great example if you want to look at how um, this bank identified their prioritization of risks and understanding how material certain risks will be through consultations with stakeholders. And I'll leave um, this thing's, oh, actually, I think I still have a little bit of time. So maybe we um, can quickly go through this, this example. Um, so just um, to note that in, in this example in particular, the risk management section of the 2021 Bank of China Corporate Social Responsibility Report, it illustrates the process um, from environmental risk factors, um, again, both transition and physical, um, through to the financial impact of the bank. And as recommended by the TCFD's guidance for banks, um, it illustrates how this impact risks traditionally evaluated um, risks, such as credit risk, operational risk, market risk, and liquidity risk. So as you're trying to identify that additional component for banks, this is a good example you can use. Okay, and with that, um, before wrapping up this section on risks and opportunities, um, here's an important tool that we mentioned yesterday that you can make use of. This is Unipify's 2023 Climate Risk Landscape Report, and it assists financial institutions in better understanding the diverse and dynamic landscape of climate risk tools. And as a reminder, you have um, the team that developed this report here today. So if you have any questions, um, please do ask them. And I'm just going to um, skip this slide here, and then we land now on choosing metrics and targets, and I will pass over to my colleague to take over now. Thanks. Hello, everyone. Uh, this is Huma Sefkazi. I'm manager of sustainable finance and capital markets in CDP India. And uh, today, in today's session, I'll walk you all through the slides on how choosing metrics and target setting for climate-related disclosures, which is the final pl uh, pillar of DCFD recommendation. So I would request for me now to please move to the next slide. Yes. So just as a reminder to you all, the matrix and targets pillar of the TCFD is the very inner layer, and all of the other pillars of the TCFD recommendation are really underpinned by these appropriate and effective matrix and targets. As Tiffany was mentioning earlier that these are developed and created through the materiality lens, these matrix and targets really need to be grounded in climate uh, information that is financially material. 
Uh, and uh, this fourth pillar is all about disclosing the metrics and targets that are really used to assess and manage climate-related risks and opportunities. Next slide, please. Yeah, so uh, in this slide, let's break this down into the three uh, disclosures that are recommended by the TCFD. So first here we see the matrix category and uh, with this we have a list of cross industry matrix that are important for all organizations to disclose on including transition risk, physical risk, climate related opportunities, internal carbon prices and remuneration. And then with these, it is also important to disclose any, uh, you know, sort of assumptions or methodologies used to come up with these metrics that uh, you basically are disclosing. And then for banks in particular, on this first recommendation, uh, there are the three pieces of guidance on metrics that banks should be addressing in addition to the general guidance on metrics. So firstly is that banks should uh, report on the metrics for their lending and financial intermediary business activities. Secondly, they should report on the carbon related assets. And then thirdly, it's uh, basically recommended that banks report on their performances in aligning with a two degree or lower scenario. And here really ensuring to connect strategy disclosures and risk management disclosures with matrix. So how you are using a scenario analysis to inform the sort of matrix that you are developing and how you're tracking that over time also plays a very important role. And then the second area of matrix and target disclosures specifically, or uh, you know, uh, really hones in on those greenhouse gas emissions because those are so important in relation to climate change and are specific metrics that the TCFD deems to be financially material to all the organizations, including banks. So in other wo uh, words, basically, uh, how many emissions is in your pro uh, portfolio will have a financial impact on any bank. So it is important to know this information. And here it is recommended that all companies even beyond banks should disclose scope one and scope two, and if relevant, scope three emissions using the greenhouse gas protocol. That's sort of the you know, preferred and recommended methodology from the TCF team. As a quick reminder of what these three scopes uh, you know, are, so scope one are the direct emissions that, uh, you know, those are company uh, causes by operating the things that it owns or controls. These can be a result of running machinery to make products, driving vehicles, or just heating buildings or, you know, powering computers. Scope two are indirect emissions created by the uh, production of the energy that an organization buys, installing solar panels or sourcing renewable energy rather than using electricity generated using fossil fuels would uh, cut a company's scope two emissions. So scope three uh, emissions are also indirect emissions, meaning that uh, those not produced by the company itself but they differ from scope two as they cover those produced by the customers using the company's products and those produced by the suppliers making products that the company uses. And you may also note that um, I said if relevant for scope three for banks, those uh, scope three emissions are likely going to be really and very highly relevant for banks and so important to look at all these uh, three areas, all three scopes and not just the first two, it's specifically for banks. And with that, there's a specific guidance for banks to report on greenhouse gas emissions from lending or other financial intermediary or you know, business activities using the uh, PCAF methodology, which is Partnership for Carbon Accounting Financial. So the final recommended uh, disclosure for this pillar is the tar targets that are being set. In this recommended disclosure, it is uh, highly recommended that all companies should report on uh, long term as well as interim targets, con considering absolute and uh, intensity based uh, calculations, time frames, base years and key performance indicators. And just to clarify, uh, we sometimes get questions about, you know, absolute versus intensity emissions and uh, absolute emissions are sort of the gross overall emissions associated with our, an organization, whereas intensity emissions uh, refers to an organization's emissions related to some sort of economic output, such as revenue, for example. And then again, uh, with the uh, targets as the others, we see that it is important to report and disclose what methodologies you are using to come to sort of the conclusions that you're, you know, you are around targets. Next slide, please. Okay, so in this next slide, uh, we see some of the progress uh, on all three recommended disclosures for matrix and targets sort of year over year. 
and uh, based on the fin uh, fiscal year assessment of 2021, the percentage of the companies reporting across all three recommended disclosure ranged from between around 40 to 50 percent. And while it is, you know, great to see programs or progress on all of these, I would like to particularly note this more drastic increase in the disclosure of climate related targets, indicating that uh, companies are actually really recognizing the importance of setting targets to manage the risk and opportunities that uh, might they be identifying. Next slide, please. Okay, so perfect. So let's have a look at some of the examples now uh, to hopefully make this a bit clearer, clearer and a bit more concrete. This example shows how a South African bank, which is Standard Bank Group, reported to reflect the impact of uh, climate related risk in its credit portfolio. The bank's report notes that the data represent an uh, you know, aggregation of sector exposure based on the current data classification structures and expects that as the methodology for calculating climate related indicators and metrics evolve, the bank's capacity to report more granular concentrations will improve. So they have matrix for sectors with relevant or uh, with elevated transition risk exposure, such as coal fired power generation and oil and gas. They have matrix for sectors with elevated physical risk, specifically looking at the agriculture sector, which is very vulnerable to both acute and chronic risks. And then really importantly, uh, they start to disclose matrix for opportunities by looking specifically into opportunities created through climate mitigation in the renewable sector. Uh, over to the next slide, please. So next, we have an example coming from the Bank of China's 2021 CSR report. On the left hand side, we have a narrative description outlining some of the you know, Bank of China's climate related targets. From the diagram itself, you can see that the proportion of total credits to brown industries account for around 10% of the corporate loans. So this uh, basically helps us to understand the exposure of the banks uh, lending to high risk sectors and uh, how they are really performing and managing these risks over time. Bank of China has set a goal to increase green financial services and decrease investment in brown industries, which is highly appreciable. Over to the next slide, please. Okay, so next here we see the Bank of England's roadmap for reaching net zero. And this provides for banks and other financial institutions a clearer picture of the sort of the pace and direction of travel for the UK financial system. And this pathway and other jurisdictional pathways can be used to help inform your own uh, interim and long term targets to manage these risks. The UK government has legislated for net zero by 2050 and is currently exploring how that can be achieved. In the previous year's climate disclosure, the Bank of England committed to reduce emissions from its physical operations to net zero by 2050 at the latest. So this net zero target will cover uh, the full scope of the bank's physical operations and is consistent with the target in the Climate Change Act of 2008. So the bank's strategy to achieve its net zero target is currently being explored in the context of the ongoing development of global norms in climate transition planning. And the bank aims to publish its net zero transition plan for its physical operation as part of the next year's climate disclosure. In doing so, it also aims to you know, contribute to the development of net zero transition planning within the next uh, context of the central banking. What is important here to note is in terms of improvement is that this net zero target refers to its physical operations, but not its financed emissions. So the Bank of England did indicate that, uh, you know, they have started calculating financed emissions in alignment with the partnership for carbon accounting financials, which is PCAF. Uh, next slide, please. Okay. So uh, this would be the last example, I believe uh, I have here. It comes from the European Bank of Reconstruction and Development from the 2021 TCFD report. So EBRD provides a historical record of annual grain finance commitments. And from this uh, diagram that we have here on the slide, we see the bank's annual green finance commitments growing over the time, really helping us to understand and track progress in this respect. This also shows us that uh, in both absolute terms as well uh, as in relative terms or intensity based. And as recommended, this target and metric is in alignment with the strategy of the bank as well as comes with the matrix and explanation of how this is calculated. So I think this is the last slide for the session. 
Okay, so and with that uh, was our last example, and hopefully this sort of matrix and target disclosures are a bit clearer for you. And but again, happy to answer any questions that you may have, and please feel free to drop them in the Q and A section, and I'll take over them. And uh, I think we have a time for a small break also, so I'll pause here and ask everyone can come back in you know five minutes time, and we'll start again with the second half. Thank you.
So um, a warm welcome to everyone who returns after the break. Um, so the second part of um, today's training session, we will begin by talking about net zero target setting and approaches to robust transition plans. And um, before we start, I thought it would be appropriate for me to briefly introduce myself. So my name is Jan. I am originally from Hong Kong and I'm now based in Zurich in Switzerland. I work alongside my colleague Wenmin, who presented the governance and strategy pillars of the TCF the framework yesterday at the climate risk and TCFD team at the United Nations Finance Initiative or the UNEP-FI. So if we go to the next slide, um, first let's set the context for today's discussion. What is net zero and why should we as financial institutions even care about setting emissions reductions targets or transition plans? So it would be great if we could start by watching this video now. Scorching heat waves, record wildfires, rising seas. These consequences of climate change are hitting us already and will do so much harder in the future. To avoid the worst climate impacts, global greenhouse gas emissions need to be slashed in half by 2030 and reach net zero around mid-century. The term net zero gets thrown around a lot these days, but what is it and how can we get there? Reaching net zero emissions requires us to do two things. First, we must reduce our emissions to as close to zero as possible, as quickly as possible. Phasing out coal, investing in clean energy, shifting to electric vehicles, protecting forests, and reducing food loss and waste are just a few ways to shrink our carbon footprint. Second, we need to pull just as much carbon out of the atmosphere as we pump into it. This can be done by planting trees, which absorb carbon into their trunks, limbs, and roots, as well as by deploying emerging technologies, such as direct air capture, which takes carbon out of the air and stores it in geological formations underground. A number of countries have already committed to reach net zero emissions by 2050, and some nations are even more ambitious. For example, Norway plans to reach net zero by 2030, and Finland by 2035. In 2020, all countries should put forward stronger national climate commitments that put us on a path to collectively reach net zero emissions by 2050. And in this process, they will ensure a bright future for our children and all life on Earth. Yeah, so you can find the link to this video in a chat. And so feel free to watch it again if you want to. Um, basically, net zero means re reducing greenhouse gas emissions to zero by balancing the sources of um, emissions that often largely stem from fossil fuel consumption and other industrial processes and the sinks of um, emissions, which refer to the extraction and sequestering of greenhouse gases from the atmosphere, such as from biomass capture and geographical storage of emissions um, or from sinks due to land use change. In the video, you heard multiple important milestones that come from the IPCC, such as to limit global temperature rise to the Paris goals, global emissions must halve by 2030, and emissions must reach net zero by um, 2050. This shows a clear linkage between emissions, especially the cumulative net emissions of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases, and changes in global surface temperatures. To be specific, any increases in the global concentration of these greenhouse gases in the atmosphere will lead to further warming, and hence um, putting a stop to um, these, putting a stop to human cause and ch um, climate change would require us to reach net zero, that is reaching a blood balance between greenhouse gas entering the atmosphere, the sources, and those removed from sinks. And um, however, despite a lot of mitigative measures to reduce emissions, some sectors like for example, aviation and agriculture will likely have to residual emissions that are difficult to completely remove, which is why reaching net zero will also likely require ongoing balancing of any of these residual emissions. And this is exactly the reason why companies and financial institutions need to set net zero targets and robust transition plans that demonstrate how these climate pledges or emissions reductions target are aligned with the net zero pathways alongside broader economic um, company strategies. If we um, go to the next slide, you can, so we now know that net zero is essential to putting a stop to climate change and emissions need to 
um, drastically decrease. But there are ways, there are always discussions about the difference between limiting the global temperature rise to 1.5 degrees versus to 2 degrees, as um, the Paris Agreement talks about both. On this slide, you can see this nice graphic from um, WWF, which summarizes nicely the differences between the 1.5 and 2 degrees um, scenarios. In short, such a short, um, such a 0.5 degrees difference can mean ice-free summers in the Arctic Ocean that would lead to um, longer ice-free summers in the Arctic Ocean, which would lead to more than 70% increase in flood risks. Um, and then suddenly we will have over 99% of coral reef that would be lost, which means ocean acidification acid, will threaten um, biodiversity. And then we'll also have an additional 1.7 billion people that will be exposed to heat waves and an additional 3 million people that would be threatened by rising sea levels by the end of the century, as you can see um, in this changing nice graphic. Altogether, it just really demonstrates that um, we have the urgency to act towards net zero that, again, is about balancing the sources of um, emissions that often largely stem from emissions from fossil fuels burning and other industrial processes, and then the sinks, which, again, is the extraction and um, storing of greenhouse gases from the atmosphere. And um, moving on to the next slide, we now know that there is the urgency to act towards net zero, right? And then this translates into the need for the private sector, including financial institutions, to set a transition plan, meaning a strategy to shift towards low carbon economy. And this is increasingly a salient issue, given an uptrend in some jurisdictions, such as in the EU, there are already regulations that are requiring robust transition plans. And um, to develop a robust transition plan or net zero strategy, firms really need to identify and understand the key steps to how to set emissions, redu um, emissions reductions targets. And on this slide, we can see a framework from the Science-Based Targets Initiative, which is a collaboration between the United Nations Global Compact, CDP, World Resources Institute, and um, the WWF. Here, they provide guidance that help organizations set a net zero strategy or transition plan, which you can see starts with first selecting a base year, which forms the basis for organizations to track the emissions performance consistently. And then second, calculating the company's emissions, which is about emissions inventory at different levels. It could include company subsidiaries. And then third, setting target boundaries and, um, and then the next one, choosing um, a target year. Um, excuse me, which boil down to emissions reductions um, targets that could include interim targets that are short to medium term or longer term targets. And then at the end, we, um, nearly at the end, we'll want to choose a target year and ensuring that the target boundary is aligned with um, our emission inventory boundary, that it determines how to treat, which includes how we treat company subsidiaries or um, yeah, um, other parts of the corporate. And it excludes the use of carbon credits and um, avoided emissions. And lastly, calculating the targets. It is important to note that the TCFD recommends two things that are relevant to this process. Number one, the provision of emissions reduction targets, including interim ones, and second, um, an explanation of how emissions reduction targets are calculated. To this regard, there are actually different methodologies or metrics that can be used to measure or understand emissions. Emissions calculation can be done via three approaches, absolute emissions, um, intensity-based calculation, or finance emissions. And we'll talk about these methodologies and metrics in a later slide. On to the next slide, we delve deeper into the target setting stage. The TCFD actually has um, a paper for guidance on metrics and targets and um, transition plan. I'm going to copy and paste the link to this report, which you could download. In summary, um, if we look at setting effective targets for um, reaching net zero, it could translate into targets that are aligned with strategy and risk management goals, um, targets that are linked to relevant metrics, quantified and measurable targets, clearly specified over time, which includes 
um, clear explanation of the base year, the baseline time horizon, whether it's short, medium, or longer term targets, which includes interim targets, um, understandable and contextualized targets, period that are periodically reviewed and updated and reported annually. We will talk more about um, how these different principles of effective targets um, can be applied in a later slide. But then on the right side, you can also see a figure from the TCFD guidance report that um, you can navigate to the link in the chat to have a look. This um, shows um, how a hypothetical firm is approaching to set net zero targets, which includes um, interim targets. Basically, this firm commits to reducing net scope one and scope two emissions as defined by the GHG protocol to zero by 2050, with an interim target to cut scope one and scope two emissions by 50% to uh, against a 2015 baseline by 2030. And, um, <clears throat> Excuse me. They're also working with suppliers to reduce scope three emissions. This whole graphic and effective targets really demonstrate why interim targets are essential, particularly when reaching net zero could pretty much be a forward looking into a distant future, which in this case is 2050 specifically for this company. And there are different pathways that can be followed based on the different scenarios analyzed. And in this case, um, this graphic is involves um, scenarios that are adapted from the NGFS scenarios that we already discussed yesterday. And um, this slide, you can see a summary of the metrics that can be used to calculate emissions. We can delve deeper into these methodologies or, method, or, or metrics. Um, they can be broadly categorized into three approaches, absolute finance emissions, which measures a financial institution's share of a borrower's emissions. This method is aligned with um, Partnership for Carbon Accounting Financials, or PCAF, as you can see on the slide, which stands for a global partnership of financial institutions to work together to develop and implement a harmonized approach to assess and disclose greenhouse gas emissions that are associated with their loans and investments. And um, the second approach would be physical emissions intensity, which is often expressed in the result as um, relative to a specific business metric. For example, here you can see as um, production output or financial performance um, of the company. And um, it could be ex expressed in terms of ton of CO2 equivalent per unit of product produced or value added. And this metric can be used as an indicator of carbon efficiency of um, or carbon intensity uh, that are that could be applied to analyzing how a sector or a company is doing in terms of the emissions performance. And it's interesting to note that for different sectors, either the absolute emission, um, which is the first method, or intensity-based metric are recommended by the science-based target initiative. And then the third approach would be finance emissions lending intensity, or FELI, which translates to a borrower's absolute finance emissions to an emission intensity metric based on the amount of um, financing and a financial institution commits to the borrower's sector. And then at a portfolio level, this metric is calculated by dividing the sector portfolio's absolute finance emissions um, by the financial institution's total sector financing. And um, for more guidance, in terms of calculating metrics and targets, you can make use of the TCFD metrics and targets guidance. Again, the link again the link is um, already in the chat, or you can also um, download our um, our report from UNEPFI, our technical supplement, which talks about the different sectoral approaches to carbon and counting. That can be downloaded here. At, um, the second link that I just posted to the chat. On to the next slide. So. We, this is the net zero target setting example from um, Citibank within their disclosure. We can see here from their report that is um, similar to what we just discussed, a robust framework or pathway for setting and achieving their net zero targets. You'll recognize these steps which we recently discussed, including calculating their emissions, really looking into what is their baseline, what is the current status, what is their starting point. And then from there, in step two, they looked into identifying different pathways. So we have mentioned the NGFS yesterday, but they are 
also using another set of reference scenarios, which is developed by the IEA, International Energy Association. And it's important to use whatever scenarios that fits the market or um, the company's portfolio best. And then based on these, um, Citibank actually established some target setting. So what they did was they really wanted to see by 2030 and beyond 2030, um, what they, um, the emissions performance and then steps four and five are also very important because these are really about the implementation of their strategy to reduce emissions. Decarbonization is really like a marathon. We need to have the right tools in place and be um, ready to, for planning in the long term. And in this case, they really out, Citibank outlined how they wanted to engage both internally and externally to make this strategy work. And um, also through elaborating on the opportunities they want to take along the way and how they want to achieve their targets. And um, they also focused on external engagement because this is an important step to inform the stakeholders that the bank is, um, it, dealing with their clients, investors, and to really disclose the information, including the emissions performance and how they approach to reach the different targets that they set in terms of emissions reductions, which you can see at the bottom of the stage. There are um, actually two sectors, which is based on um, a heat map analysis. And they came up with two priority sectors in which they want to submit their emissions, re -targets, emissions reductions targets. and um, for uh, for a more focused approach to reaching the net zero target that they set that they set out in the plan, um, you can see the first sector is energy, and you can also immediately see that here are scope one, two, and three emissions, and then they also have included a baseline year that they are choosing, which is 2020. And again, it's up to firm to come up with what base year they want to choose in terms of measuring their progress towards emissions reductions. And um, onto this slide, if this is an, another example from a report that's by Barclays. And um, looking at this report now, this you can see a chart that is taken from their 2022 climate strategy report in which they shared um, what they have done and um, what they have announced. You can see that um, previously they had a target set for reducing carbon emissions by 80% from their own operations to source 90% um, of their electricity needs from renewable, resource, uh, renewable sources, which cover scope one and two emissions. And um, in fact, that managed to over, they managed to overshoot this target and have achieved instead a 86% of emissions reductions from their own operations and 94% of renewable electricity that were sourced. Based on this, they are sharing a new announcement of um, a renewed target, which is now 90% of greenhouse gas emissions reductions by 2025. And um, at the bottom of this slide, you can see as well as some portfolio targets. Um, over there, um, for energy, they put in place an absolute emission target, and they are targeting a reduction of 15% against the baseline of 2020 by the end of um, 2025, which is their target year of emission reductions. And they also have, um, they are also tracking the performance in terms of emissions reductions for this end year and also setting interim targets for 2030. So they want to reduce emissions by 40% in terms of absolute emissions for the energy sector. And then for the power sector, they also take a very similar approach to um, the previous example from Citibank. And in which they are using emission intensity reduction approach to um, approach the emission reduction targets for the power sector. So we can see from these two examples within the market that could hopefully shed some light on how target setting could work in terms of um, um, setting out a transition plan or a net zero strategy. Um, so we know that net zero transition plans will only become more important in terms of measuring and managing climate related transition risk. And um, by transition plans, we, we mean in order for us to 
reached net zero target, we need a plan that includes that showcase a company's or financial institution's commitments inherently, and then also the steps that they are taking to track emissions performance and then improve towards um, achieving near term, interim or longer term emissions reductions targets. So we've talked earlier about the good practices or the principles of effective target setting in um, recommended by the TCFD guidance, which you can check out through the link in the chat or on the slide. Um, how can which answers the question of how can we set transition plans to answer this the tcfd highlights um, the following seven um, key practices that should be considered when developing our transition plan um, first aligned with strategy it means that a transition plan should be a part of and aligned with an organization's broader activities for addressing climate related risks and opportunities which in turn should be um, a part of and um, aligned with um, the overall company business strategy and second the transition plan should be credible which means there should be sufficient information to enable users or readers of the reports to assess the credibility of the transition plan. For example, the transition plan should describe the organization's current capabilities, technologies, transition pathways, and their financial plan. Organizations may also want to describe significant limitations, their constraints and uncertainties in the transition plans and then even challenges and then include a plan of how they want to overcome these difficulties and challenges. And three, um, anchored in quantitative elements, including climate related metrics and targets. Our transition plan should be designed to consider and help achieve specific targets in an organization's planned transition to a low carbon economy and the progress to tracking how they are progressing towards these um, emissions reductions targets should be um, regularly tracked using appropriate metrics. The transition plan should be consistent also with the broad economy or sector wide science based pathways to a low carbon economy, which could be found via the different reference scenarios developed by, for example, the NGFS, the IEA. And number four, actionable specific initiatives, which means that our, trans our transition plan should articulate specific initiatives and actions the organization will undertake to effectively execute the transition plans, including regular milestones. For example, the plan may articulate how an organization plans to reduce scope one emissions by investing in new technologies and processes or by encouraging suppliers to reduce emissions in the progress and in, in their operations in order to reduce um, scope one and even scope three emissions. And number five, the plan should be periodically reviewed and updated, which means that um, it should be re um, reviewed at least every five years and updated when necessary. Organizations should review their transition plans in line with the review process, the governance process for their climate related targets in order to ensure the continued relevancy and, ef and efficacy to an organization's overall strategy planning process. And number six would be reported annually to stakeholders. This means organizations should report publicly or to stakeholders their initial transition plans and significant updates to the plan. In addition, they should also rep report progress against their transition plans, the emissions reductions target annually, um, and include a comparison of completed actions to plans and um, or planned actions in the prior to the reporting period. And lastly, it would be a, a, um, an effective transition plan should be subject to effective governance process, which means that um, the plan should describe an approval process and oversight and, and um, accountability responsibilities within a, an organization, including the role of the board and senior management, how they're overseeing the plan, how they are overseeing the process in which emissions are calculated and pro and how progress uh, is checked, is tracked. Um, moving on to the slide, you can see an example disclosure here from um, a Dutch asset management firm, and it also includes a roadmap or a transition plan. It shows that um, decarbonization pathway that this firm is approaching, and it lists the measures that they will take or have, take, have taken for each 
um, five-year period from 2015 to 2030. The baseline here, baseline year here is set in 2019, and um, the net zero target for them is by um, 2050. The commitments are to reduce emissions from the investment portfolio and operations by 30 and 25% respectively by 2025, and then by, by 50% by 2030. This means for the last 20 years, there is still a 50% reduction in terms of emissions. And um, it's relevant here to note that there is a distinction between um, emissions from the investment portfolio and the operation, which illustrates my point from the previous slide that emissions from the investment portfolio. Um, the primary scope three here is much higher and more challenging for financial institutions or an investor or asset manager to manage as, um, and then it requires a different approach, such as investing in climate finance, because scope three emissions is really about indirect emissions throughout the value chain. And um, we can move on to the next slide, which you can see. So we know that a lot of financial institutions are already dedicated to supporting a transition to net zero. And many of them have also joined the GFANS, which stands for the Glasgow Financial Alliance for Net Zero, which is an alliance that was launched at COP26 in Glasgow in 2021. And today they include over 500 financial institutions that have committed to um, net zero emissions by 2050 that are in that are in line with um, the goal of limiting the global temperature rise to within um, 1.5 degrees Celsius, which is the most ambitious Paris Agreement goal. As we can see here on the slide, the GFANS framework transition plans includes a set of goals, actions, and accountability mechanisms to align an organization's business activities with a pathway to net zero emissions that delivers real economy emission reductions that are in line with um, achieving global net zero. And for GFANS members, our transition plan, must, I mean, if an organized, if a financial institution has joined GFANS, they must come, um, they must come up with a transition plan that has to be consistent with achieving net zero by 2050 that are also aligned with them. The most um, ambitious, uh, ambitious Paris goal agreement, which is um, the 1.5 degrees Celsius in terms of um, the global temperature rise limit that we have mentioned earlier. And um, as you can see, this framework is quite similar to some of the things that we have already seen um, for the TCFD re reporting. So the foundation here, here is that there should be um, a bank-wide net zero commitment with targets. There should be timelines and priorities, and then these will be translated into an implementation strategy, which will align business activities with a net zero target, and um, also an engagement strategy, working with clients, industry companies, suppliers, but also peers and the broader society and governments to support the real economic transition to a net to a low carbon economy or net zero. This will require metrics and targets to assess and monitor progress and good governance with clear roles and responsibilities um, and oversight as um, we just saw under the TCFD framework. If we move on to the next slide, which is this one, you can see um, how from the GFENS 2022 report, which you can um, navigate to um, through the link um, on the slide here, it outlines four key approaches to, prog um, to progress uh, the transition plan to net zero in the in the real economy. They can be seen as relating to four types of companies, providers of climate solutions, companies that are 1.5 degrees, um, aligned companies that need to transition to 1.5 degrees um, global warming target and um, companies that need to phase out high emitting um, assets before their end of life. They can also consider how to reward companies that are 1.5 degrees Celsius aligned, for instance, by providing cheaper funding and um, for the in contrast, for the higher emitting clients, the bank can also develop um, plans to, for example, how to engage with them in order to help them reach um, a more robust transition plan. You can refer to the um, report that is um, linked through the slide here for more details. 
Okay, so before we end um, the second part of, before we end our session today, we have an activity to test a bit of your knowledge on um, transition plans and to really help you think through the different strengths and drawbacks of different strategies, such as those outlined in the previous slides. And um, please navigate yourself towards menti.com, enter the code there, and um, we can do the discussion questions. I'll just give um, a few minutes so that people can already log into menti.com for the activity. Hi, Jan. And just for anyone who hasn't used Menti before, um, you can access it through various different ways. So you can use your telephone to um, aim the camera at that QR code and then open it um, in your telephone. That way, um, you can also um, go to www.menti.com and type in that code um, that you can see. Then thanks, it's just been added to the screen as well. Um, and then you'll be given a few options. And momentarily, I will share my screen so that everybody can see the results. So the question here is really about the strategy mix that best suit um, your organization in terms of considering short term um, horizon for um, transition plan. It could the, the options include engagement with high emitting clients, divestment from these clients, or um, financing for the transition of these high emitting clients, rebalancing of sector portfolios to shift to a lower emissions clients, expansion of financing low carbon sectors or the expansion of financing climate solutions. So let's see the results. we can see that um, quite a majority of um, the participants today have seen expansion of financing climate solutions, which includes carbon removals or bioenergy as um, the strength, as well as financing for the transition of high emitting clients, followed by the third one, engagement with these high emitting clients, which is... Um, interesting to see. So um, just to add a bit of note and note here, um, you can of course navigate to the SBTI for the for the um, sector specific guidance in terms of um, what they recommend to do in terms of um, enhancing transition plans through either engagement with clients, investors, or um, but the main point is really about finding the strategy that fits the, the needs and strategies of your organizations. So I guess with this, I'll just hand over back to the colleague at SSE. Sure, maybe I'll take them through another couple of mentees if that's okay, Jan. Sure. Um, so we have two more slides here. Maybe just on this one to note with everyone, of course, um, the strategy um, mix is going to differ from one organization to the next. 
Um, here I see that since the majority of you say expansion of finance and climate solutions, I think that's a really good initial strategy. Let's keep in mind that what we finance today, we're going to see kind of come out in the future. So in the short term, kind of in the immediate term, that's a really good initial start. But also engagement with high emitting clients. We had few of you select that, still quite a lot. But at the at this stage, at the short term, if you start engaging with your clients, you were, are less likely to have to divest from them if they're a particularly risky company. So that's really interesting there. Um, now let's see what you all think about the medium term. And I'll give everyone time for that one too. Hey, we see um, quite a few answers coming through on this. And, and again, the focus has really been on expansion of financing. Now, um, I can see that the financing for the transition of high emitting clients is, is ticking up a little bit more. A lot of you are seeing that maybe that's more relevant in the medium term. Um, and uh, divestment and engagement are staying quite similar there. So now if we think logically from the short term to the medium term, so for example, to 2030, if for example, we started engaging clients in the short term, um, that we might want to in the medium term be looking at uh, focusing a lot more on that financing. So yes, financing those uh, transitioning um, companies, if we're going to engage them, we might have to then provide financing too. Um, so that's, that's a pretty good medium term strategy then is to start financing for the transition and of course, continuing expansion of financing of climate solutions. Now let's see what everyone thinks for the long term. We'll go to the next slide here and I'll give you some time to fill that one in as well. Okay, great. Thanks everyone who's participating in that there. So we see a bit of a change in this one. And I think everybody's really kind of understanding the strategy mix here, which is great. So as you can see, um, expansion of financing has continued to grow. Um, so um, that is logical because as we move forward in time, we will have more technology um, available to be able to invest in. Um, however, another highly motivated strategy here is divestment. And I think you're right to put that in the long term. 
if you focus first on engagement and financing those companies who can transition um, in the short and medium term, once you get to the long term is when you're going to have to start considering divesting. If these companies are not transitioning and if there's not enough um, risk mitigation and adaptation, um, then they will become very risky companies in your portfolio. Um, so divestment at that point might be a clear strategy for your organization. Great. So I think based on that, um, Menti, it's quite clear. Um, Vanina, you can um, share your screen again and put the slides up and then we'll continue on. Great. Thanks so much for that. So um, uh, as with last time, um, we would like to leave you with a number of resources to continue on. Um, so we have been sharing a lot of them in the chat um, and the Q&A. Um, so I hope that's been useful for a number of you. And I think we're getting through nearly all of the questions as well. Um, but let's make sure that you have all of the resources that you need as you continue on this um, learning journey. So in the first instance, I really highly recommend making use of the numerous TCFD publications that have been developed to help organizations to disclose climate-related financial information. And as a reminder, in addition to the recommended disclosures report, which was of course launched in 2017, but then updated in 2021, the FSB also developed an implementation guide that was also updated in 2021 and supplemental uh, guidance and on metrics and targets, risk management integration and disclosure, and on scenario analysis. And all of these um, can be found on the website, uh, the FSB website, as well as on the TCFD Knowledge Hub. Um, also, if you would like to kind of review the basics of TCFD, you're welcome to watch our pre-recorded sessions on the SSE's website or some of the previous sessions um, specifically for banks or just the broad TCFD sessions, which you can find on the SSE's YouTube channel. Our general training on TCFD is called TCFD 101, which is an introduction to climate-related financial disclosures and TCFD 102, which builds experience on all four pillars through examples. And all of our recorded sessions um, can be found on our YouTube channel, um, which will be shared in your chat box there. Great, and in addition to our training sessions, the TCFD Knowledge Hub also has CPD certified training on a number of different aspects of climate related financial disclosures. So as you continue along your climate disclosure journey, I highly recommend getting to know this website where you can find numerous resources. And a number of you have been concerned about the transition from TCFD to ISSB. The good news is the ISSB is also developing a uh, knowledge hub. So um, I suspect that um, a lot of this information will be pulled into the ISSB as well, and you'll have an additional resource then to access knowledge resources and publications. Just to highlight on this slide here, as you can see um, in the Learning Hub, the, the courses you can take really go beyond just the basics of TCFD, although you can do, for example, an intro to TCFD or understanding the TCFD. But also, as you see here, you can do specific sessions on scenario analysis, on biodiversity related disclosures, on water related disclosures, um, on embedding climate change into financial management, governance of climate related risks, et cetera. So please do make use of that great um, tool there. Great, and also if you're looking for guidance specifically for banks in the fin financial sector, um, UNIPFI has a number of tools tailor-made for banks. Uh, for example, these two publications, uh, the Impact Radar and the Portfolio Impact Analysis tool for banks can be found on UNIPFI's TCFD program page, which we link to in your handout on this slide. Um, the Portfolio Impact Analysis tool is a really useful interactive output um, workflow based on UNIPFI's unique holistic impact methodology. So you can find all of that on their website. 
and also some additional resources to flag today that can be helpful for banks and the financial sector more broadly are here on your screen. The first is by Oliver Wyman called From Ambition to Reality, and it focuses on actions required uh, within corporate banking divisions, and it sets out five key priorities to make the commitments real. Uh, the second publication by GFANS um, is uh, it provides recommendations and guidance to deliver a global framework for ambitious and credible net zero transition plans for financial institutions across the financial sector. Um, the third report is by UNEPFI again, and it provides guidelines for the banking sector, particularly for setting climate targets. And finally, by the Portfolio Alignment Team, um, which was formed by the UN Special Envoy for Climate and Finance, Mark Carney. Um, this publication helps to respond to growing investor and lender interest in measuring portfolios relative alignment to the objective of the Paris Agreement, and it provides guidelines on measuring portfolio alignment to the 1.5 degree target. Great. And um, before we close out today, I do want to um, give more information about this CPD certificate for those of you who were not here yesterday. So as a reminder, you do have to fill in a Google form. It's a quick survey. Um, it provides us feedback on this training, and it also tests a little bit how much you've absorbed. Um, so we would like you to just take a moment. It only takes um, a few minutes to fill in the survey that's shared in the chat box, and also that's sent to you by Zoom. Just to note, because we did get a few emails from yesterday, the certificate is not automatically sent to you. So you fill out the form, we receive that you filled out this form and we have to verify your participation um, and that you've completed the form. And then within a week, we'll send you out a certificate. So please have a bit of patience and we will send the certificate out within a week. Um, you will get two separate certificates so if you filled out the form yesterday, please also fill, to, fill out the form today if you want both certificates. I see someone saying that Google form is blocked. We do find that sometimes. Um, we recommend using maybe a personal device or opening the survey at home in order to access the survey. Um, and we find most people get around that, those blocks that way. Um, great, so um, I think that should um, cover that all. We do have a few moments for questions actually today. So I'm gonna open up the Q&A box here. Um, we're not gonna open microphones today because of connectivity issues, um, but just to know um, a few questions that we're getting here um, in our uh, Q&A. So one, oh, actually we got quite a few um, questions on GHG emissions and um, what to use to move forward. And just to note and reiterate from what we discussed earlier, um, that all uh, the TCFD recommends that all organizations make use of the GHG protocol um, in order to um, uh, share their GHG emissions and to calculate them. However, banks um, are also recommended to use PCAF. Um, so you can find all that information in our slides and also in the Q&A, there's a few links that might be interesting for you there. Um, uh, another few people were asking about verification in the Q&A. Um, so just to highlight to everyone that um, it is not required um, by the TCFD to verify um, your reports, but increasingly companies are doing this. And it's important to keep in mind that your reporting is indeed to investors and um, they would like to have assurance of what you were reporting. So some companies are um, providing assurance for that. Um, uh, it's not necessarily mandatory, however. Um, what other questions do we have here in the q and I'll pick maybe one more here before we move on. Okay, well, someone was asking about um, the IEA report and that there's um, there's quite a bit of different perceptions here about whether or not we can achieve 1.5 um, by um, the, the suggested timeline that we want to achieve um, 
at 1.5 by. And there have been reports saying maybe we've already missed the mark or maybe we can't achieve 1.5 um, in time. Um, however, I want to reiterate that the TCFD um, is not um, the same as science-based targets. And the science-based targets um, really is ensuring that your targets um, do align with 1.5. The TCFD is rather assessing those risks, right? So whether or not we're going to achieve 1.5, it's important that you as an organization understand what does that mean for your financial impacts? So if we miss 1.5, that might mean we have much higher physical impacts and we might have increased um, flooding and temperature rises, et cetera. So those physical risks we we're discussing are going to be much higher. However, we make it to 1.5, we might have to deal with many more transition risks. There's going to be shifts in policy changes and regulation, technology changes, all of that sort of thing. So that's why the TCFD recommends that all companies do at least two scenario analysis. So we want to understand a scenario of uh, 1.5 or 2 degrees, but then we also want to understand a scenario at a higher degrees to understand how our company can remain resilient um, in those different, um, different scenarios. Okay, so with that, um, I'm going to um, continue on just to note we're still answering your questions in the Q&A by typing, but I'd like to um, pass back to um, Ashutosh. Are you going to um, introduce our closing speaker or did you want me to? Sure. No, uh, thanks a lot, uh, Tiffany. And uh, thanks to you, uh, Uma and Yan, for a very engaging session uh, over the last couple of hours. Uh, for the closing remarks, uh, I just want to invite uh, uh, from IFC, uh, Mr. June Park. He's the Regional Portfolio Manager, South Asia for the Financial Institutions Group. Uh, June requesting you uh, to please provide uh, the closing remarks for the audience. Hi, Ashutosh, can you hear me? Yes, June, we can hear you well. Unfortunately, I think uh, so I'm having some problems with the speaker. Hold on. Can you can you give me a thumbs up if you can hear me? Yes, June, we can hear okay. you. Okay. I can't hear you, but I can't. It seems like I'm audible. So, so let me just start by saying thank you very much. Uh, my name is June Park. I'm the Regional Portfolio Manager for FIG uh, Financial Institution in South Asia for IFC. And on behalf of IFC, I'd like to take the opportunity to thank all the participants to the financial institutions for participating the last two days. Uh, and a big special thanks to our global partners on this training. Uh, so UNSSC, uh, Tiffany, uh, UNEPFI and CDP, and also our Indian program partners, IIBF, Indian Banks Association, and the European Union for making this training possible. Uh, this two-day uh, training session would have given you an overview of the, how, one, the climate uh, can be integrated into governance and strategy, as well as how banks uh, can manage risks associated with climate and set climate-related metrics and targets. Uh, assessment and measurement of climate risks and opportunities are building blocks of TCFD framework which helps organizations more effectively disclose climate-related risks and opportunities through their existing reporting processes. While TCFD adoption in the emerging markets remain low, this is starting to change. As we know, financial markets around the world are beginning to integrate climate transition risks and opportunities into investment decision-making. There is a growing demand for decision-useful climate-related financial information by investors, which has led to a need for banks to update their knowledge on climate-related risks and reporting frameworks use. In particular for India, as we talk about it, there is a growing recognition that climate change poses risk to financial institutions, highlighting a strong case for early action to ensure an orderly transition. By equipping our bankers with knowledge, skills, and mindset to embrace sustainable finance, we can drive positive change and contribute to a more resilient and sustainable future. If we look at the green finance flows in India in the financial years 2090-20, it's about 38 billion per annum, which kind of sounds large, but 
it's less than India's green finance needs. And despite several initiatives, the climate funding gap continues to be a key barrier in achieving ambitious climate goals for India. And you probably have seen all the heat changes and all the changes that we feel in an everyday life. And the role of the financial institutions is central to India's transition to a green economy and to develop new financial instruments that deliver both investable returns and environmentally positive outcomes. At the same time, adopting green practices offer banks in India powerful means to differentiate themselves and grow by attracting international capital and customers seeking sustainable finance options. India is a priority country for IFC. We have been working with regulators to enable markets for climate finance and working with financial institutions to develop a robust pipeline of bankable projects that meet the standards of investors. In addition, IFC's investment and advisory services team are supporting our clients to build a climate finance portfolios. This has been done through knowledge sharing and in-depth advisory support. So please feel free to reach it. Reach out to uh, Ashtosh and the team or uh, any particular uh, climate-related you know, advisory opportunities that you see for your respective organization. We will also continue working with our partners on these uh, initiatives. Moving forward, we plan to undertake similar such training and also relevant research and analysis to help foster better understanding of climate risk assessment frameworks in India especially leveraging IFC's global expertise in this space. We will also continue to collaborate with IIBF and IBA to further strengthen the knowledge, capacity, and awareness of financial institutions on green finance. Uh, lastly, I also encourage you to register for the e-learning and certification program on climate risk and sustainable finance that was launch launched in May uh, along with IIBF you can please reach out to the organizers for more details on this matter. So thank you very much for joining us today and I hope you have a great evening. Back to you, Ashtosh. Thank you, June, for your remarks. And uh, thanks again a lot for all the uh, participants for attending both uh, the day one and day two. Uh, and of course, uh, especially to the uh, partners, uh, UNEPFI, uh, UNEP SSC, uh, CDP, and IBA and IABF and the European Union. So thanks again, everybody. I hope you have a good evening. Thank you.